Welcome to Mountain Strong. Today we're at Far North Bicentennial Park. We shot the last video at a location that we accessed via the North Bivouac Trailhead, and we have now crossed the road to the South Bivouac Trailhead. Just to have a look at the creek here. This, of course, is Campbell Creek. We've talked about Campbell Creek in previous videos. It is a creek which runs across the city of Anchorage, but of course we're outside of the city of Anchorage right now, and uh, the Far North Bicentennial Park is the first stop on your way to the Chugiak State Park, which we've talked about in other videos as well. And uh, of course, after that, you're just basically in the wilderness, and you might as well say you're in the wilderness when you get into that state park. But uh, as you can see, a beautiful day, spring day. It was really interesting noticing the difference between the North Trail and the South Trail. In the North Trail, I was walking through the forest and it was really just as quiet as could be. It makes a fellow nervous when he walks into a place as quiet as that. But coming down here to the creek, spring has truly sprung. I'm hearing birds and uh, there just seems to be a whole lot more life about the place. And I'm looking forward to uh, summer uh, being on the way. Today we're having a look together at Psalm 48. Let's go ahead and read it now. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. In this psalm, we're getting a look at just how much the people of God appreciated the city that God had given them as the capital of the land that God had given them, the city of Jerusalem. When they were inside the city of Jerusalem, they were reminded of how mighty and how powerful their God was because this was a city they didn't build. This was a city that they didn't obtain through their own strength or their own might. God gave it to them. He gave them the victory over the previous inhabitants, gave them this beautiful city situated on a hill, perfectly situated to be able to survey the surrounding countryside. And so inside the city, they experienced God as a fortress, as it were. And he says that in the first few verses. In verse 3, he says, Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. In verses 4 through 8, he examines the enemies as they approach the city of God and how they really see the city of God and they're astonished, they're astounded, and immediately they feel as though there's no hope. They feel as though they're coming up against something greater than themselves. And you can't help but think of all the times in biblical history when people came against the city of Jerusalem only to be repulsed and to be defeated. I think especially of that time when the Assyrian army surrounded the city of Jerusalem during the time of King Hezekiah and how the Lord in a single night felled 185,000 troops. God is mighty and he mightily protected the city that was the capital of his people. There's two illustrations that are used there to describe the enemies when they face the city of God. The first, they're in agony as a woman who is in childbirth. And the second, they are like ships that are smashed in the sea. They really have no chance when they come against our God. In verses 9 through 11, it is in the city of Jerusalem that the psalmist had experienced God's fine attributes. He'd experienced his steadfast love in verse 9, his righteousness in verse 10, and his judgments in verse 11. And so in verses 12 through 14, he encourages people to walk through this city. He encourages people to note all of the various features, to remember them, and to tell them to their children so that their children could in turn praise God and experience God as a fortress. As we reflect upon this psalm, there are a few lessons that we can draw from this. One, I really appreciate how the psalmist is teaching us how to give glory properly. What is the fortress of the psalmist? Or rather, who is the fortress of the psalmist is the question we should ask. Because 
He might have been tempted to say Jerusalem and it alone. And in fact, in later generations, they will be guilty of just that. They will be guilty of believing that Jerusalem cannot fall. In fact, a great deal of the prophetic work of Ezekiel was just convincing the people of Israel in captivity that the city of Jerusalem was not going to be spared from the wrath of God. And so he says, give glory to God. He's our fortress, not this place. He gave us this place. And so he is greater than this place, as great as it might seem. Number two, as we think about what the psalmist gets across in this psalm, he's teaching us that we don't arrive at any blessed location on our own. It's important, and I think it's really important, that when we talk about the good things that happen in our life, that we give proper glory and proper credit. All good things come from our God. And so in the psalm, he's reminding the people of Israel that they are what they are, and they are who they are because of God. I appreciate what one of my teachers used to say all the time in the, in the school of preaching. He used to say that if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. And really it is that way. We don't get where we are by ourselves. And especially as it relates to the, the spiritual heights that we reach, the physical heights that we reach even. How many people in the United States feel that they've been blessed because of their hard work and because of their intuitiveness and because of their intelligence and so on? No, they've been blessed because of God. They've been blessed because God has chosen in His mercy and in His greatness to pour out His love and His care upon this nation. That's the only reason that they have been blessed. And if God chooses to remove those blessings, all of their strength, all of their might, intelligence, etc., that's not going to get them out of that situation. Number three, as we continue to think about this psalm, we're struck by a very, a very powerful statement in verse 14. And you might think it's a mistranslation in the English Standard Version. It says, This is God. Now, wait a minute, is he saying the city of Jerusalem is God? Well, most translators uh, choose to, to work their way around that reading rather than reading it that way because it would make it seem as though, yeah, Jerusalem is God. But I think that the reason for this statement within the context is that God has provided this city and that he is as real as this city. Sometimes we can convince ourselves that God is very far away, but there in the city of Jerusalem, there where the temple was, Everything was there to remind them that God is real, that God exists. And as I think about being the temple of God today, the church of God today, the church of Jesus Christ, as I think about being in that blessed position, we should of all people be continually convinced that God is real, that this is God, that He is there. And so the fourth lesson that I want to take from this psalm is the idea of being thankful for where we are. We've talked in previous psalm studies about the fact that sometimes in the life of faith we are going to be discouraged and how a certain degree of pessimism is to be expected in the life of faith. Uh, a, a, a honest evaluation of the realities that we face. But at the same time, if there is only pessimism, there is something wrong with faith. Because faith that is only pessimistic can't see the truly optimistic and the truly beautiful place that God has provided for His people. We have a song in our songbook called, Come We That Love the Lord. I'm pretty sure that you've sung that song before. If you haven't, uh, you can easily find it on the internet. What people sometimes don't realize is that there are two authors. There's the author of the, of the main body of the song, and then there is the author of the chorus of the song. The chorus of the song makes it seem as though we haven't arrived anywhere, and that we're actually going somewhere. We're marching to Zion. Well, thanks for that, Robert Lowry, the author of that chorus. But if you listen to the words of the song, what does it say? It says, we're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We've already arrived somewhere precious. We've already arrived somewhere blessed. And the song encourages us to, to, to taste the sacred sweets and to realize that our God is awesome and that He has provided us with something truly awesome. And so may this song teach us to, to walk through the, the spiritual Jerusalem that is the church in our minds and in our hearts. Mark the citadels, mark the walls, and mark the reality that our God is a fortress and that He has given us something truly wonderful. The manifold wisdom of God is manifested in the church. Let us reflect always upon how beautiful and how precious it is as the psalmist reflected on how beautiful and precious his capital city was. May God bless you today.